you know, to buy like a hundred million of property the first time it took me like 10 years. Then the second time took a three. Mm-hmm. Maybe it'll take a year next time. Yeah. Maybe we'll do that. I'm Drew Brenneman, and this is the Rise and Invest podcast. I bought my first two properties as a 19 year old with my own money that I earned from an online business I started in high school. I've now grown my portfolio from that first duplex to hundreds of millions of dollars of investment property. My goal with this show is to give you the resource I wanted when I first started out. Subscribe to our podcast where I break down real life stories, tactics, strategies, and current market information you need to be a successful investor. Welcome back to the Rise and Invest podcast. With me today is Javi Mendez. Welcome. Thank you for having me on again. Yeah. So Javi works here at Rise Invest and the other day was asking me some questions, just kind of different what traits or skills you know might make somebody good in the business. And the questions are really good. So I was like, <laughs> why don't we uh, maybe let's hold them and like, we'll, sh- we'll shoot a podcast about it. Mm-hmm. So here we are. And so I think, too, maybe before we dive into that, just want to mention something. Um, it's included in the outro that we have for this, but not haven't talked much about it, mentioned it in a couple recent episodes. But uh, our website, we have a ton of written resources. So I know if you like the podcast in terms of that, it's easy to listen to, obviously, on the go. Um, we have more on the website. You know, for example, we have our portfolio listed. So every property we bought or currently own or even the ones we have now sold. Uh, you know, we have the details on each property and two or three paragraphs on each deal. So essentially like brief case studies uh, are on the website for them. Plus we have a blog, put quite a bit of time in and Javi's written different things on it, especially mm-hmm. about uh, how we're using AI and machine yep. learning. Uh, we have a trends report uh, out, just kind of what's current in, in multifamily and investment real estate today. Uh, and then kind of the big thing we have on there is our passive investing guidebook. The goal of that guidebook, it's about a hundred pages and teaches someone where kind of could start from scratch, not knowing much about uh, what to look for or how these deals work. And really everything's in there to how, how you make money in real estate, different jargon people use. There's a glossary in there. Um, I think I'd mentioned this on a different podcast too but i'll say it again my my dad just he recently watched one of these and mm-hmm. he was like what is this he kept using this term over and over again it says like four percent five percent something and mm-hmm. um i was like i first i guess irr but then uh, we would be saying four or five percent i'm like oh that's got to be cap rate mm-hmm. um and then it's it's so now i should you know if we if that happens again and you don't know um he had never heard of cap rate before he's not in real estate um or if you don't know what that is now, you should check out our guidebook. And mm-hmm. then we got the definition along with a ton of other things in there and practical tips too on like how you could vet a sponsor, what to look for. Mm-hmm. So all that's on our website. The website is riseinvest.com. And then you can also sign up to be an investor in our deals on our website. Just in the upper right corner, we have a orange button you can click. It says invest now. You can sign up to be on our investor list. There's not a cost or anything or doesn't take any money to be on the list necessarily. Um, you just putting a little bit of information about yourself and then you're, um, you speak to one of our, our folks and then you're on our, on our investor list for when deals come out, you'll see them. So I think now that that's out of the way, I mean, Javi, so let's just, let's fire away. Just dive whatever. in. I had like a few different sort of like overarching topics that I had questions for and I kind of broke them out. And I first wanted to start off with like things like specific to you, like as my boss. So when you're in any industry, this is like more general, like people have their work and then people have their passions. But for you, your work is your passion. Like you're down here basically working, hustling every day. Um, So what about real estate led that to be more than just like a way to make a living for you? Yeah. And what's, what's interesting too, with what you said, uh, so you've worked here for like roughly a year. Mm-hmm. Like normally I would have worked way more actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, like I, um, and even just to kind of worked out, we're just having uh, my son every other weekend and so much during the week where I just like, I can't work every weekend now. Yeah. It's where before I was working pretty mo- at least one day every weekend. And I mean, depending on what we had going on, you know, every weekend to some extent. And yeah, it's like, why would you do that? And I, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, I, in a way I lucked out of sorts where I, like, I do really like doing this mm-hmm. and I really like, you know, really, it's not even like about making money so much. Like initially that was definitely the goal, 
but then I really like getting the like the re- result uh, and be having the success from something. Mm-hmm. And what I found um, with that, like, kind of one of the things that I've always done, or you know, I'd say done for sure the last let's say call it like ten years, is like working ahead is how I think of it. So let's say, or even like on the, the deal we're buying, when it's like who should draft the purchase contract. Mm-hmm. You always want to draft the contract because then you you got everything you wanted in there. Like you're to me, that's like that's working ahead. Some people think of that as like, well, let's have the other party draft it. I'm saving legal fees. But every time you uh, make a change now, it's like, hey, here's my change. Whereas if it was your contract, you have what you want in there. And then so I kind of apply like that to like most everything. Like I can see what, let's say, the company needs mm-hmm. and then. If I can get ahead of it, whether that's working at night or on the weekends or whatever, like we'll have a great result from that. Right. And actually what's probably the last year I've worked from like ahead, like the least, uh, where I know it's, I work plenty, but like where that's been a big thing. Um, when I think of that, like came to my mind when you're like, you're, it's like a passion, but it's also like, mm-hmm. that's led to a lot of the success, I think. But then, yeah, just kind of where I wasn't, you know, so yeah, going back to high school, maybe when I first made that money from the internet business, you know, I was looking at all sorts of different things to do with it. And I really did like real estate. Um, real estate's an interesting thing where kind of like most people I talk to are like interested in it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying like the people in multifamily investment real estate, like even just regular people, like they're they like, I mean, there's a whole, there's different TV stations where it's just real estate TV stations. Yeah. Home and Garden Channel and different stuff. And I mean, Bravo is like half of those shows are real estate soap operas basically, mm-hmm. but like they like, but people like real estate. So then, yeah, in a way kind of just lucked out. But then I do, uh, I do like the result from working hard because the, the question was like, how's kind of like a, why is it a passion or mm-hmm. what's more than work? Yeah, that's kind of, um, yeah, so I think that would be, be why. Hard to say. Mm-hmm. Specifically know, what it is that yeah, makes but it I, a passion. But I like the result and I, uh, in terms of like, okay, I actually buying the property, I don't get that excited about, I would say, like the the closing day. Like I get excited about finding a new deal yeah, and like putting in the deal together, let's say. So okay. you raise the debt and equity, you got it set up with a great business right. plan. I really like to that point then getting it closed and <clears throat> reviewing the accounting and other things that you need to then do after mm-hmm. closing, let's say that I don't right. enjoy. So for you then, cause I was going to ask you this, like the part of real estate that gives you like the little serotonin kick that you really enjoy, it's actually finding and seeing a business plan that'll work. It's not necessarily the closing process. And I know you really like the sort of asset management side of it, like actually executing the business plan. Are those two parts, the parts you really like about real estate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, where so just because you already knew the answer to that, mm-hmm. that where yeah, I like getting the deal set up, mm-hmm. but then from there, there's so much other work that goes into it, and that's not as exciting. Um, mm-hmm. It's all very important, you know, where right. and so you need to be on top of it, but it's interesting where, yeah, getting the deal found and sort of set up the debt and equity and the business plan is, let's say, the thing I like you know, probably second most. And mm-hmm. then what I like the most is actually then, okay, once you're closed and it's, you're ready to go actually executing that plan. Right. Cause now that's more just, it's less of real estate. It's more like we're just out here kind of conducting business now. Like what mm-hmm. makes sense to do to the units, what paint colors are on trend, what, uh, what upgrades would make sense to do, what wouldn't. And mm-hmm. it, like, I just like that it covers so many different facets. You know, you're working on legal issues and, mm-hmm design and construction and finance and like it's a big variety yeah that's I, exciting to you don't want to be doing the same thing every day so yeah every yeah every deal is pretty different um so then that you get the variety after after close i feel like running that mm-hmm. deal then also seeing how you can do it better mm-hmm. you know doing stuff like the due diligence or reading the loan docs like that my thought process is less about how how are we going to do this one better versus just like, well, we need to read everything and right. read through it. Okay. So. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I thought that, you know, something that I noticed about you is that like, there's lots of different things that you do well and basically everything you do well, but there's little things that I really want to know from you is basically what do you think personally attributes that you have help you the most in real estate? Because you do basically everything well. So what has helped you the most in, in the industry? 
Yeah. The, well, what's interesting with doing things well, like I would say, I mean, like I'm doing them well enough. Like, mm -hmm. but if you think of like my, like me being able to use Excel, like I'm mm -hmm. not as good as like you or Evan or Tom or like most, you know, most people that work here, you know, but I was able, I was good enough where I was able to calculate everything I ever needed. Um, you know, prior to everyone starting, you mm -hmm. know, so I was able to do it well enough. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say like, I'm like a superstar at like every piece of this though, like mm -hmm. kind of how you worded it where like, that's not, it's not really the case. I think kind of like, um, like thinking about it and I've learned a lot the last couple of years to hiring kind of seeing like what, uh, cause not something you'd think about. Yeah. And I tell people like, I will be, I just need to get like another, couple people like me and we'll be like crushing it. And people would tell me like, well, you're not going to find that person mm -hmm. that was, and I would, I don't, I don't think like that. Like, I think I would find them. Like, I don't mm -hmm. have this outlook to maybe that's part of something to mention. Like I don't have a disposition where like the glass is half full or I will never find that person or I'll take this risk. And it, I'm th thinking about all the ways it won't work out. Right. I do think about those, but I think as much about how it will work out. Okay. Um, but in terms of like traits, I mean, I did, you know, we do this traits test for hiring here and like my pattern was like the number one pattern for strategy. Mm -hmm. So then that's something that I've always been good at is strategy. Um, and then I'm detailed, like that was the other thing in that. So those probably like natural traits, let's say those mm -hmm. two. And then from there, I mean, I was just, I built the skills needed. Right. Cause the, the, the question was what's like what traits or skills have led to success. Right. Yeah. And I think so then probably those were the traits. And then the uh, same thing in that traits pattern, I had a critical thinking pattern mm -hmm. where basically it's a, you have two types of folks in that, on that trait where you either are, are good at critical thinking or right. you're not, and you, but then those folks are really good at following the a process where you have, uh, um, they see it done a couple of times and they just follow the process. Right. Where I'm not like that. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I need every step. Like mm -hmm. it's almost would, I, I know what you want to have happen and I'll do it. Right. Like we'll get the result, but I don't need the eight steps to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, from there, then probably just like, uh, skill wise, you know, and this time I realized while shooting the podcast was, okay, so how does someone like build confidence, mm -hmm. you know, in like, or make like a decision. Right. So in general, I don't make like fast decisions. Um, like I'm slower than ever to maybe make a decision, but I'm really not afraid to make the decision or to do something big. Right. And cause even, you know, getting rise, uh, invest staffed up and some of that, I'd explain it to people, people that had a lot of money and the kind of what I'm doing. And they would, they'd be like, I don't understand why you would do that. Like you would do a deal, you make the money, you keep it all. Like, mm -hmm. why would you hire people to do that? Now you would make like less. Okay. But what if we did more deals, yeah. you know, and then things went, you have, you, you're doing more deals and you're speeding things up, you know, to buy like a hundred million of property. The first time it took me like 10 years. Then the second time took a three, mm -hmm. maybe it'll take a year next time. Yeah. Maybe we'll do that this year. You know, like it's different. So, um, the, uh, what I was actually going towards and got a little sidetracked was more Then I built skills. And so this confidence thing, I didn't realize like that comes from having like the skills. So then we shot an episode about underwriting. I think Evan had mentioned it where we can act confidently because we've underwrote so many deals like this in Phoenix, let's say. Right. So I didn't realize that kind of, uh, came over time. Cause then, so like, I believe in what we're doing or what at the time, if it was just me, what I was doing where, yeah, I underwrote 20 deals and then mm -hmm. this is the best one. I'm not, I don't really have the mindset where I need to see another 80 deals to know. Right. I just, this is the best out of 20. That's good enough. Let's buy it. Right. So that, um, so then some skill building, uh, from there, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So you basically, you went over the stuff that has helped you succeed. What kind of skills do you think people lack, uh, or better phrasing would be like, what kind of people struggle in the industry that you've seen? Because we, we, everyone talks about the kind of people that succeed, but we don't really talk about the people that would struggle. So what kind of person do you think would struggle in real estate? So the, uh, it's definitely a make a, make money slow mm -hmm. business where the people that you see that do really just extremely well in real estate, it's usually as simple as like, if it's in Chicago, I know someone whose dad was buying duplexes in Lincoln park, which is 
one of the nicest neighborhoods here Mm -hmm. for 50 grand each. And now they're all worth a million dollars. Yeah. Like it doesn't need to, you know, if maybe he could have sold them the next year for 55,000 and made uh, doubled his uh, 10% down, you know, down payment. But instead, you know, he was making money slow and Mm -hmm. now they own, you know, it's like 50 buildings like that. Yeah. And then they bought bigger stuff since. So it's not, don't worry, they didn't only make, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> just this, that, that money. They, you know, turned it into more. But yeah, that, so I would say people that are in a big rush and then there's so many facets of the business, like you being detailed mm-hmm. really helps. So if you don't have attention to detail, that's going to really hold you back. That's something I learned at my first uh, full time job. Right. So I worked at Dominium. They have like 30,000 apartments or, probably more way more now they're uh growing so fast but yeah at the time it was like twenty thousand. and the, kind of the way they explained it is like okay you're the first year associate you underwrite the deals you need to submit basically the thing to the next person up the chain like the partner that might do the deal mm-hmm. like a, the model needs to be perfect like there's no room for mistakes like getting yeah. like a 99 on the test was good in school but we're not gonna buy a 30 million dollar deal and then realize, oh, just one cell was wrong, and actually it doesn't okay. perform now. Right. So you, uh, they explain that really well, and you sort of realize once you're um, out in the real world, this isn't like school anymore. And a lot of jobs or different industries, there's no, there's no room for error. Right. You know, this is not life and death. So like, it's not like being a doctor where like there would legitimately be no room for error. Right. Where if there is an error, like we're just dealing with money here, but like that's the mindset that like I um I really started bringing and I don't know if I would have had that if they that wasn't just flat out told to me like that's the expectation right um like cuz the other thing that's interesting too as like the owner or whatever where stuff gets brought to you the pace with, with which it's done doesn't matter to let's say me because if someone could do something five times faster than the next person but if it was like 95% done I don't even know what I'm looking at yet. Like right. this, I don't have confidence in it. So what's interesting is like, yeah, being detailed, not mm-hmm. being in a rush is just so important. So if you're doing the opposite of that, that's that's what comes to mind on holding somebody back. Yeah. So because that and that's exactly what it was like there. And uh, I'm sure what I'm like, where usually uh, there's not a lot of deadlines or I'm not hounding someone like, where's the model for that deal? Mm-hmm. Like we need to make sure we, everything's right. There's no point at rushing it and then realizing you had the wrong you didn't have time to check your loan assumptions or your right. rents or anything so yeah and then actually talking about underwriting let's shift a little bit to like the deals because my assumption would be you're starting real estate your main concern is you know doing good deals but you wouldn't say that you said that it's actually getting the deals closed and funded that's the main concern can you like expand on that a bit yeah, I think, yeah, starting out, I would think most people's concern is just like, how do I make money? Like the goal for like being an investment business in general is making either yourself or others money. Like that's mm-hmm. what the business is at like the simplest level. So I don't know, starting out, I mean, yeah, my goal was just to make money with the best vehicle possible, mm-hmm. which I realized was real estate yeah. in terms of because the risk is relatively low, but then you're leveraging up the investment. So you're making right. it more risky, but the underlying, let's say, product is quite stable, especially multifamily. So like, I just really, really like that. And so that I guess my goal initially was just was making money. And then what you realize is like, well, okay, the way that this like gets bigger and expands is thinking about other things like your reputation and, right. you know, just sort of like a track, like building a track record. But yeah, you're, the reason if I talked to it was more about getting deals closed was on your first deal, you're not thinking, okay, I need to be building my track record or a reputation. Like you're mm-hmm. just, you're just worried you're going to get the loan closed or that you, uh, that I say I'm less concerned with like maybe, um, the closing process now. Cause I bought mm-hmm. like 40 plus buildings. Like, but if you, on the first one, my worry was about just getting this thing closed. I'm mm-hmm. reading a book. Cause the first deal I bought is a duplex and I didn't have an attorney, you know, that size deal you just buy with your realtor. Mm-hmm. I'm reading, I'm looking at my real estate investing book and it's like, Oh, you need to order title. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? Yeah. You know? Um, so like that, I'd say probably initially I'm more concerned with just like 
how the heck does this deal get closed? Mm-hmm. And then, like, then after that, like, how do you run it? So initially, it wasn't really about necessarily the details like we've been like talking about. It was mainly just how do I get this thing closed and making sure you have something that can actually you know give you cash flow. Kind of initially, what I looked at was figuring out if the deal can um, if it could cash flow. I know I've mentioned that to mm-hmm. you and others where because that was like something to me simple I could learn to calculate. Mm-hmm. Here's what the rent should be. Here's what the expenses should be. Valuing the property. That seems complicated. I've, like I was able to do that with like a simple, these small deals people use gross rent multiplier. Mm-hmm. So I did figure out like roughly what people do, but there's so many outlier deals. Mm-hmm. You know, you're getting your confidence on that. It's that's harder because you'd say, okay, this was in Madison, Wisconsin and a normal deal at the time. If the tenants were paying the utilities in the unit it was a 10 gross rent multiplier. Right. But then you'll see this person pay a 12 and you're like, why did that happen? Mm-hmm. You're kind of like, I wonder what, uh, or then someone sells for eight and a half and you're yeah. kind of wondering now I really, I could list every reason why that could happen. The, you know, the lower grocery multiplier, it's cause mm-hmm. the tenants are paying the utilities or the building has deferred maintenance or the location's worse or mm-hmm. just lots of things. It's the potential growth for it's worse. Cause the unit mix is poor. It could all be two bed, one bath or something. And, or, you know, in college town worse, a four bed, one bath, you know, yeah. or something. <laughs> so, but that, uh, you know, or why would it be higher? It could be one of the, it could be a really great location, newer property, um, or like some of these buyers where, Hey, they bought 50 and those families were in Madison too. You know, like they already have 50, you know, two to 20 unit buildings. This is number 51. I don't really, I, I care, but not that much. The price is good. And I already own five buildings on that street. Gotcha. Yeah. So that, uh, Yeah. So, I mean, it's easy to now like say like, oh yeah, focus on track record and reputation Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, build like a best in class platform. But when you're starting, you're not thinking about any of that. You're just trying to not lose your money. Right. Download our hundred plus page passive investing guidebook today at riseinvest.com slash downloads. Accredited investors can sign up for our multifamily investment opportunities by hitting the invest now button on our website. Now back to the show. And then when you start to scale, let's say you've already got some duplexes at that point, you're going to be working more with just like a simple mortgage or something like that. You're going to be going to, you know, banks, like substantial commercial banks or like Fannie and Freddie and stuff like that. That can be sort of intimidating to some people if they're starting out. What advice would you give to people that are trying to do that where they're trying to go to like Fannie and Freddie to get a loan for a property? Well, I guess for starters, like the first deals I was doing, yeah, those were just bank loans that are probably that more mirrored like a home loan Mm -hmm. you know so my lender on all those it was uh wisconsin bank so i think associated bank on the first one and then Mm -hmm. mni bank um got they got bought by bmo uh, in 2008 or 9. you know so those were you just had a banker and you know explained Mm -hmm. your deal and they sent them the numbers and those are more like almost just like a residential mortgage they're curious what you made and uh Interestingly, a lot of folks, act, believe it or not, were like surprised I paid taxes on this business I had in high school, oh, really? which I'm not like that. I wouldn't cross my mind not to. Mm-hmm. Um, but that came back to be a great benefit because I had a documentable income. So then I could get these loans because it wasn't right. it's not like these commercial deals where they more look at the property. This was they look at your income and mm-hmm. then actually they take like they do their like funny bank calc of like your income now, oh, you're buying the property, but then that will count you the rents at 75%. Mm-hmm. So that goes to your income, but then a hundred percent of the expenses mm-hmm. and the mortgage. So like you need some income to like get that, to, yeah. uh, pencil out. Uh, and then, so yeah, how do you jump into like work with bigger lenders? Is that the question? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I started to sort of tiptoed into that almost where then you go, you still work with a bank on the next deals, but it's like a commercial loan. Right. So the process not that different. Uh, and then over time, yeah, we've done a lot of agency lend uh, borrowing, but all that you go through an intermediary. Mm-hmm. So I guess my advice would be like, so intermediary, that's a fancy word for, uh, let's just say like a debt broker, mm-hmm. you know, just to make it simple. That's not almost probably a pejorative term to them. <laughs> like they're more than a broker, they're an advisor and they, they, um, you know, it's not like, uh, oh, we just put the loan out to the market or whatever right. they're get, But anyways, point being, you, you can get to, uh, the Freddie and Fannie through any, uh, debt intermediary basically. And so, yeah, what would my advice be on that? Like, well, f- 
the more practical thing, try to find a lender who's already a dust lender. So delegated underwriter servicer for Fannie. And then I think there's a similar term for Freddie. Um, mm-hmm. Cause then you're going sort of straight to the, who, who's talking to Fannie or Freddie where a lot of the loan brokers, they might, they don't have a dust license or whatever the term is for it. Right. So then they're going to like the ones that do the CBREs, the Greystones, mm-hmm. the, North Marks, where they can do the business directly with Freddie, but you go to another company that isn't directly doing it, you're sort of got like a lot of layers now. Right. Fannie and Freddie need to make money, the dust lender does, and your loan broker does. So if you can kind of pick a loan intermediary that already can can do the dust lending themselves, you're gonna you you should save some money. Um, if you don't, your dust lenders is collecting it all. Um, <laughs> But then like how, so then my advice would be find a lender, one of these lenders and that would, that's patient. It will answer all your questions. That's good. Cause yeah, I mean, you've seen what I'm like. I mean, we just had this call actually with this sewer company oh, yeah. basically <laughs> where I know I'm sure everyone thought that was like nuts that was listening. But basically what happened was I asked this guy the same question five times because he wasn't giving me an answer I could understand. And like uh, we were very nice about it. I asked it different ways and it was like. So I'm like, okay, great. And then, but what about, what did you do here? And then mm-hmm. this is the same thing. Cause it's important to know mm-hmm. what's going on at that building with the sewer. Right. And I can't just take an answer that I don't, I don't understand. We need to figure it out. And so I would approach these programs like that. Like, it's not like some magic thing that you could never understand. Like how do these loans work? Right. Ask the questions. If you want to know how the program works, even the behind the scenes stuff, they can answer that. But what would be important to know as a borrower is like, what are all the options like for, for within this program? Uh, there's you can do five, seven, ten year fixed with Fannie, uh, twelve and fifteen year fixed, and you can do floating rate. You can do different prepays. You can do different interest onlys. Like if you are at lower LTVs and higher debt service coverage ratios, you can get pricing breaks on the rate. There's affordability right. uh, discounts, meaning if your rents are below a certain percentage of the uh, what else in this, this, I, this piece, actually, I don't know. Cause none of our Chicago stuff falls in this, but there's some, if your rents are at a certain level, even not, if it's like a low income housing deal, just that even a market rate deal, you can get a break on your loan right. on the rate. So answering all those questions and really understanding the program, uh, it's a long answer to, for it. But like the reason I'm comfortable with that is cause I've asked the guys we use like yeah. a million questions. And I don't say this to be like, cocky but i would imagine there's a lot of the loan intermediaries that aren't actually like dust lenders at this point i bet like i understand the program better than a lot of those brokers yeah because i've done 30 of the loans i've seen them sized i've done i've asked on every deal i don't know five to a hundred questions and so (laughs) i've had a thousand things told me about the program and um you know so like that's been uh like so then i just i have a good understanding of it and people that are not they're not like salesy, yeah. you know, when we call our loan people, it's not like, uh, they're not like rushing us off the phone or, um, yeah. like they're happy to answer questions, tell us what's going on. Yeah, that's good. And then just for the deal in general, people also have concerns about the types of deals that they might want to be doing. So what kind of deals would you say that you really liked and which ones did you not like in terms of general commercial properties? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause so I've done, uh, multifamily Mm -hmm. within that within that i've done student housing Mm -hmm. i worked at an affordable housing developer Uh, most of the stuff we're buying these days market rate uh, apartment deals and i've also bought i worked at a retail developer Mm -hmm. uh, internet office developer and i bought all these product types too where i bought an office deal i bought a couple an industrial one i bought half dozen shopping centers um so yeah, what's interesting, so just to kind of break down the product types and like, okay, um, from like best, ex- worst experience to best, let's maybe go that order. <laughs> so one thing with like office, until you, um, yeah, the way I would describe office with what I know at this point is it's like a hot potato. You can make money. You just need to pass it once you get to like 100% or 90 plus percent occupancy. You got to get mm-hmm. get rid of it. Right. So if you can buy it at, you know, whatever, 30, 40% or 0% occupancy, great. Then you get a full and you got to get rid of it. And why I say that is like the, the cost to uh, lease the space 
for the your broker, your leasing broker's commission, the tenant's commissions, the free, the tenant's broker's commissions, excuse me. So there's two brokers oh, in wow. this for leasing, uh, unless you're doing it directly, but now that's like an employee, uh, mm -hmm. like that you're hiring to do the leasing. It's not like an apartment where you just put it on Zillow. And mm -hmm. this is a complicated decision. People have advisors. So it makes sense. Like they earn their money. But when you start factoring in the cost, it's like two brokers to pay. And then uh, you're going to get free rent. It's a very soft. In general, office, our entire lifetimes has been a tenant's market. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever depends on the city. But in general, I mean, the occupancy is like 80% roughly. So it's always like a renter's market. Mm -hmm. And then um, you're getting... Who, who pays to build out the space? Oh, the landlord for most of it, not full turnkey, but like the delivery that you're spending, you're just gonna spend a ton of money getting it ready. Mm -hmm. Then you need to give them a cash tenant allowance uh, as well. So when you start adding all this up, you're really seeing how it works. Uh, just like for, I'll call it for fun. Uh, I got, I looked mm -hmm. at an office deal. It's probably in 2018. I got interested. It was like a 10 cap in like a nice suburb here. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I think in Downers Grove or somewhere outside of Hinsdale where I was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is good. And um, Tank cap, not bad. I know, but here's <laughs> the thing. It's funny. I So when I, I modeled it up, the rents, depending on, it was like, I don't remember the exact number, but it was like 13 or $14 a foot, triple net rents. So that's mm -hmm. your, that would just fall, I guess, after, you know, vacancy and other non-recoverable expenses, basically to the bottom line, mm -hmm. but not included in, that you know number on the bottom line is all these costs that just rattled off for re for leasing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. When you annualize that in a per foot number on that deal, it was like eight or nine dollars a year. Wow. So the way like I started thinking about office is like what's like that free and clear actual <laughs> rent you're getting and then your your deal's not a 10 cap anymore. Yeah. You know, what's your actually gonna cash flow? It's not even close. So then those deals when I see people make money, it's like we bought it empty for $30 a foot. Mm -hmm. Then all those things I just rattled off, we had to dump another 50 bucks a foot into it to fill it back up. But then uh, we sold it for, you know, one fifty a foot and, you know, eight times their money. Like that, like yeah. that's how people make money in it. But then the group buying it at 150, they lose a couple tenants. The cash flow suffer isn't great because all the, uh, you know, just landlord costs on also renewals. So they're going to have a broker for renewals. Mm. So you're going to have a renewal commission and then they're going to need a space refresh, paint and carpet. You know, yeah. That's, you know, that's Spence going to cost money. Expensive. So anyways, just a long answer just where, yeah, learned. Uh, so we bought an office deal, did well with it, bought it for four, uh, I think 4.4 .4 million, so for 5.5 mm -hmm. um, in, in a four or five year hold. It's on our website, equal point yeah. two uh, office building. Um, but that is, uh, you know, so that's, we sort of, we've, we kind of knew that going into it, but it was even more, uh, more of a drain on cash flow than we thought. Right. <coughs> yeah. Then, then, uh, retail, you know, that's, um, it's funny emotionally. I haven't really liked owning those buildings because it's just like a sad story from every tenant on every renewal. Mm -hmm. The business is suffering, even if it's this total fabrication, like it's, yeah we're struggling and we need a rent reduction, you know, is this what you hear on everyone. And in general, it's not, if you own really good real estate and you don't have a ton of debt, what the people who know what they're doing is to say, Oh, that's, well, send me your financials. Let's take a look. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, uh, I guess you can, you don't need low debt and know what you're doing to ask for that. That's a great, that's a tip. Uh, yeah. I, I made even a checklist for myself on these commercial deals. We still have like what, to do because mm -hmm. you get caught off guard basically i mean at least i do where you get this rent reduction on renewal request and then what do you do mm -hmm. so i wrote out like what to do just even for myself um okay i asked for the financials like that's a big tip because kind of early on i just sort of take the sad story and then try to renew them flat to just keep them there because mm -hmm. the costs are really high to re-rent the space too right similar to office except what's a little nicer with retail is like most businesses they just need one office or at least one office in that market Right. You know, people have different offices, different city, but you don't mm -hmm. need five offices within Chicago. Whereas like with, let's say a business is doing well, you know, like a Chipotle or whatever, they have more than five locations in the city so they can open up a bunch of different ones. So that's nice that they don't close performing locations where if an office does well, they probably got to move out. We're growing. Yeah. We got to go. Um, so I, but what's interesting is those deals have done 
extremely well, actually, because mm-hmm. most of the, the tenants do stick around after the sad story. We've had really high rent growth on those. Um, cap rates have compressed because we were buying those in 2009, 10, 11. And I mean, on most of those deals, I mean, yeah, we would have like five, we like five times our money wow. on those. We, and we, you know, if we assuming we sold it today, but a lot of those we have like realized cash flow or refi proceeds where like one deal is like a, it's a four X. Mm-hmm. Uh, we four timed our money to date and we still own it like of just cash yeah. flow and refi proceeds. Wow. And so those deals, as much as like emotionally, I kind of don't like them. They've done really, really well. Mm-hmm. Same thing with our industrial building we bought like the, that done, done great. We're, um, that market rents are up a lot, um, especially in most parts of the country. Like yeah. the rent growth in industrial, it's even higher than apartments. So, mm-hmm. and it's, you know, hard to build, you know, you need big sites or, you know, like an older industrial building. Those are, you wouldn't rebuild it is too expensive. The land's too expensive or you couldn't rebuild it for what it would trade for. So that mm-hmm. sort of discount to replacement cost on that product type makes, makes there not be much like of any development. So then depending on what kind of industrial you're buying, um, mm-hmm. So that's obviously very good. And we've had a really great experience with that. Yeah. Given a long answer, so I'll speed it up. And then multifamily, I mean, that had the highest returns of any product type when we calc that in Reef data with the lowest standard deviation, lowest mm-hmm. risk, um, yep. best sharp ratio. Um, you know, so that I would, so multifamily, you know, that just kind of, I've, I've always gravitated towards just, I really like having the diversity of tenants like in our a lot of our shopping centers is two to six tenants they've gone well but i mean we have a two-tenant building and one of the tenants moved out mm-hmm. so that that deal there's no no cash flow if you're 50 percent occupied right you're gonna need to add money and so i've always liked that with multifamily and then the negative with multifamily though is like you are you pay the property taxes where mm-hmm. these commercial things this i guess one very nice thing is on all, all these leases, the uh, operating costs as well as the taxes, like those are paid by the tenant. I mean, technically, the landlord pays it, but then it's reimbursed uh, under the lease. And and so that's nice. It does impact eventually, like if your taxes or expenses got out of control, it does impact what you can charge for rent because the tenant looks at the total occupancy cost, uh, which would include base rent, right. cam tax, insurance, everything. But it doesn't hit you as hard as multifamily where, I mean... What's funny is, like, we talk about property taxes here. It might be that and interest rates, probably the top two topics. Yeah. If we were doing industrial, we would not be talking about property taxes as much. It's a it's a consideration, but mm-hmm. it only is going to really hit us when we go try to re rent the space. We have a renewal coming up. If it got so, if it, if it went up so much that now the tenant's going to say, "Hey, I, I got it." Like, a uh, you are increasing the rent. Also, I had this other increase in taxes where. Um, it's just, it's almost, it's like an afterthought yeah. of sorts. Yeah, that I mean, makes sense. Yeah, one of the buildings we bought, I think the commercial deal of taxes might have tripled after we bought it because it's a state where they just chased mm-hmm. the sale basically right up to the purchase. And we didn't hear anything from any tenants about it. Right. If it was an apartment deal, that's all we've been talking about. What's our tax number we're underwriting? It's our biggest cost and it's about to explode. Yeah. So, yeah. especially in Chicago where it gets reassessed. Yeah, but they don't, they don't chase the sale here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's against the law. So oh, they, really? they don't know they don't do that. Okay. Yeah. But in, you know, a lot of places they do. Yeah, Wisconsin, Texas they do. Minnesota, Texas. Yeah. They don't know your sale price. So they have a good strategy there. Mm-hmm. We'll just raise it for over probably what they paid. And then, you gotta go fight with yeah, them. <laughs> then they'll come to the courthouse and be like, what the heck? I, I only paid 10 million and you assessed me at 12. Like, yeah, yeah. I had so, to do that a bit in my internship where spent yeah. a couple of days in a courthouse reassessing all of the taxes for all the properties. Yeah. It's interesting. One other thing that I was wondering about with uh, relation to all the deals you've already bought is like how often your gut comes into play with a, a deal. Like, do you ever rely on like, let's say you're 50 50 on something. Does your gut come into play or not really 50 50 on what? Like, like should ownership? I buy a deal or not? Oh, well, I would say for me, no, mm-hmm. but that's, I don't think that's necessarily there's anything wrong with that. Right. So yeah, I don't really, I don't rely on my gut much, but it's cause I, cause of the people I like buy the properties with. Mm-hmm. You need to articulate like, here's the business plan. Here's what it's going to make. And then mm-hmm. they either like that or they don't. Right. This isn't, we're not buying this. Uh, you want to buy a house, take the total opposite approach. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, that's more of an emotional and need based thing. Mm-hmm. Same thing going on a vacation. Yeah. I listen to my decision. gut on that. Yeah. <laughs> like, but where, um, but for this, not, 
Not really. Um, Mm -hmm. But the people that do when it's your own money, I don't think there's anything wrong with that because when you basically like your spreadsheet is just it's your your underwriting is your best estimate what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You want to prove you want to have proof of everything you're assuming. But, uh, you know, I heard someone say something basically to the effect of like, once you make your spreadsheet, it's it's wrong. Like, you know, or like once you close on the property, your projections are wrong. Right. Yeah. Kind of thing. The general tone of it, I didn't really like. But the idea was um, you did your best effort to estimate this, but it's not going to go how you assumed. Mm-hmm. And I because I mean, even I have deals where I bought them. I thought we'd raise the rents to one number. We beat those rents by a lot, but then our taxes jumped more than I thought or yeah. vice versa. I mean, we have a deal we bought where we thought we were going to raise the rents like some amount and then the taxes were going to spike and then we got a tax reduction that we, you know, and then uh, <laughs> right. and then we realized we could actually put like 6000 or so into the units to renovate them and then get another like 300 bucks in rent. Um mm-hmm. It's the Dion Palmer, just the yeah, gift that keeps on giving one that one. That's what I'm thinking right now. But that is, um, I've had a few, like quite a few like that. So like there's, it just doesn't. So if I would have been standing there going, this is my money. Mm-hmm. I know this area of Chicago is really growing. I'm just going to pay up for it. It's hard to explain to somebody. Right. I do think that's fine. But if you're taking investor money, I wouldn't, I personally, I'm not comfortable just going like, well, everyone's projections say rents are going to go 3% and historically they've grown less than that. Yeah. But I've got a good feeling about mm-hmm. this area, so I'm going to assume five percent growth. Mm-hmm. I don't like that idea. Yeah, I agree. Or I think cap rates are going to drop. Mm-hmm. I don't want to. I don't like that don't either. Like assume that. everyone assume you should if you're underwriting, you should assume they go up to be careful uh, and underwrite conservatively. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's that'll be my thought on that. Yeah. Another thing I was wondering is, um, you know, like what kind of aspects of real estate or doing deals in real estate do you think is pretty much underappreciated from people outside or people in the industry as well. What's like underappreciated? Yeah, that is, uh, that's a good question. Cause what's interesting for like, from my experience. So I read in one of these books early on, you should manage your first property or two. Then you Mm -hmm. like you, if you choose to hire out the management, you know what you're hiring, you know, what's involved. Uh, so I listened to that advice and then I did that. So I've kind of done like in terms of uh, investing in real estate, I've done everything from mm-hmm. uh, acquisitions to due diligence and financing and raising equity and buying the property, but to like literally everything after closing, including like cleaning and painting and mm-hmm. maintenance. And even the first deal in Chicago, um, we bought, we had some like mold on the windowsill after we closed it. I mean, I just went there and cleaned it up and yeah, got it off and repainted it. Yeah. Like I mm-hmm. didn't have any maintenance people yet. And I just was in their bedroom. I wanted to handle it. And you know, that wasn't that long ago, really. Um, it feels like, you know, that was like 10 years ago, actually, <laughs> you know, like that. Um, so what's interesting is so I have that like perspective. So then to me, what's interesting is really the folks that get like no accolades, if you will, is mm-hmm. the, like <laughs> the people who spend the most time on the property, like yeah. your property manager, your leasing agent, accounting you know like they they actually spend if you looked at it like probably the most time working on a property Mm -hmm. like even that one i'm talking about the painting and we're laughing about that i mean i did a lot of work to acquire it and then refinance it a couple times and really drive the deal the right way Mm -hmm. but there's been the you know we had one guy managing that for us for like five years and then another company for like another five like they've all spent way more time on that deal than i have yeah and but no credit and all the credit usually goes to the acquisitions people or the owners. Um, mm-hmm. Really, all the money made from that deal is going to go to me and my partner on that. You know, mm-hmm. like the uh, the property manager and you know maintenance people, they'll make the least off that deal, but yeah. they spent the most time on it. Yep. So yeah, that that I always kind of find as like a funny thing, or two, or like acquisitions folks where they never even got a deal closed. You know, where you might just your job is comes in then i get it like approved internally and then like legal picks it up or the mm-hmm. due diligence team yeah like that that's interesting where like it's such a narrow focus you know that then that is uh it's helps me how it's helped me a lot having that bigger focus though. so so yeah. that good advice that was good advice and then too like if we're underwriting a deal like if i'm the one underwriting it and let's say they okay we need new air conditioners or furnaces let's say mm-hmm. here well, I know what those costs because I, re- I had to replace two this week, you yeah. know, and uh, same thing, flooring. 
I know what flooring costs because we're about to do another unit at Palmer yeah. and I'm, you know, we, the flooring we picked before at a price spike, we're picking something different mm-hmm. and I'm p- actually picking the type of flooring I installed with my dad at uh, one of those Madison properties. Oh, cool. It's still held up mm-hmm. 10 years later in a college rental. Yeah. That's something that also I found very beneficial about starting out a small firm is you do a lot more broad things than just if you join like a big firm, you know, you're focused on one specific thing and, you know, you don't really learn a lot yeah. in terms of an initial period of time. Whereas here, you know, I've done pretty much every aspect from actually the beginning of conversations about a deal to the actual closing and then the property management as well. That's a yeah. really big benefit. Yeah. And then that's, yeah, that's right. And a lot of people have said that, but you don't really realize it until maybe if you've worked at both places or mm-hmm. someone told you that, that's, you know, worked at a bigger place, but I've, yeah. I've noticed that too, or like the bigger the company, like the easier stuff sort of feels. Mm-hmm. Like if you work at a, uh, let's say a developer and they build like high rises and it's like, it must seem easy. Like you get a lot of like, compared to like, if you were just going to do the first one at like a small one, yeah. like you're getting a lot of inbound deals and you got mm-hmm. all the construction and leasing teams are set up and you're yeah. just going to use the same architect and attorney as the last mm-hmm. one. And you, you already know what's going on. Like if it's the office building, you already talking to your broker and know this law firm wants to relocate or something yeah. and and it must it probably it, it might feel like uh yeah you work on a narrow thing and then it seems easy where it's not yeah so that's yeah. something else too that I've, I've sort of realized where like at dominium it felt very easy we underwrite the deal looks good poof we buy it mm-hmm. but it's like because they have all the money and they've can got the loan guarantees and can win the, the tax credit awards and because with their reputation and it's, if you're doing your first one you'd be freaked out how hard it was yeah okay so. and the last thing i wanted to ask you is basically the generic question but what advice would you give to someone trying to reach your position because you are a principal so that takes a lot more than just being on the acquisitions team or just being on the closing team or anything like that so what advice would you give to somebody that's going to be in your position one day basically doing everything like to uh, to get to the position or to to get to it and then once you're there okay so like what i think's really helped me um a lot like so being detailed uh working ahead and if i didn't explain that well the whole contract thing it wasn't that clear but like let's let's say um you know you're gonna go to a property you're gonna tour it to mm-hmm. me i underwrite it ahead of time like i like to be right. ahead of the game or let's say you're you're gonna do a you're partnering with somebody and there's going to be a contract for that uh deal mm-hmm. the time to produce and sign and get the contract it's it's rushed like it's part of the deal once you realize you need it done the lender's asking for it mm-hmm. those are that's the one the things i did a lot on the weekends was i would get the contract ready really early and just you know and then familiarize myself with it does anything need to be changed like be ahead of it so we're not going oh where's the operating agreement it's the last minute and then you forgot you wanted to make this change or for this deal you should do something else like so uh being detailed working ahead the confidence that i realized that comes with the reps so then Mm -hmm. just somehow get the reps yeah one one thing too that i thought that's helped a lot and it's like weird to say but like because this is not hasn't come up and it's hard to like actually do this, but like who, you know, ends up being really important. Mm -hmm. Like you, you might hear that or whatnot, but like, like a big break for me was really just meeting these investors I had. And because I had two, you know, really one main guy who invested 8 million bucks initially and we, Mm -hmm. um, crushed it for him. And then another one for like double that amount came through. But like, if I hadn't met them, you know, like it, things could have been a lot harder. Yeah. I don't know how it would have gone, but like a big part of like, when you say like, how do you get to the position? Like mm-hmm. it's, I met them, you mm-hmm. know, that was a big part of it. Maybe something else could have happened or whatever. Um, I'm sure it would have turned out fine, but like mm-hmm. who, you know, becomes really important. So it's kind of interesting where if you think about even some of like the people, maybe we might look at in the industry or whatever, if you break down like what happened, mm-hmm which we don't know because we didn't work there. But if you just kind of like a lot of it could have been like, oh, they met this person who introduced them to this guy with the portfolio. And yeah. then that deal like jump started them or they met this investor and he was like, hey, I got all this money. I want to get into apartments. And then they they crushed it. So I like who you know um, ends up being really, really important where you you know, and that's like hard. How do you learn that? Or like, yeah. what do you do? I mean, you could say you would network, but a lot of these people that you'd want to know, they're not at networking events. 
You know, yeah. like if I wanted to do something with that guy who owns 50 duplexes, he doesn't go to networking events. Yeah. You know, he's probably out at the lake today. Yeah, he doesn't have yeah. to. Yeah. So then um, that and then two, I've always been, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, I've always been really curious mm-hmm. where I, in general, I want to know how things work. So then that's helped from like the conversation with the sewer guys, with the plumber. I've, I've talked to enough people doing plumbing where I know what questions to ask now. Uh, I never, you know, I'm not a licensed plumber. I've never <laughs> gone to plumber school or anything like I yeah. just, but I know what to ask. What's how things roughly work. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to fix that drain, you know? Um, but I would like, I know what to ask. I've always been curious. So then I've learned just so much, just asking questions where I think that's something that, you know, that would be, you know, so yeah. Stay, stay curious. Like that's how, cause like for me, I really, I did, I did work at Dominium, but that was only for a year. And then the next developer was for like a, for two years. So I really learned so much of this just while doing it. Right. Uh, and that was all just asking questions, mm-hmm. being curious how stuff works, yeah. seeing what other people are doing. Also, I mean, it wouldn't be, usually people are pretty nice. Like you can just reach out to people and ask them like what they're yeah. doing. Yeah. That would be my thought on that. Well, that's everything I had. Nice. Yeah. Great. Yeah. That I was uh, gonna think for some of these things, what would you say? Um, what's something maybe that's like surprised you then like this, like first year or some of the stuff that you've maybe learned you think would be worth sharing? Let's wrap surprised. That. Um, I don't know if anything's necessarily surprised me, but I've been actually, I'll take that back there. I've been surprised at how much I enjoyed certain things that I didn't think I would enjoy. Um, because, you know, coming in, I thought I'd be doing a lot more just of the analysis and the underwriting and everything, but, you know, I've enjoyed that a lot, but I, the things that I've enjoyed the most have actually been like the process of closing the deals. I've enjoyed that a lot more than I ever thought I would actually dealing with the lender, dealing with the brokers and with the lawyers and everything. I actually thought that was a really interesting thing and I was learning a lot while doing it. I never thought I would yeah. even care about something like that in terms of like in deep interest, it'd be just something I'd have to do, um, to get into real estate and like, this is a part of a job, but I was surprised with how much I enjoyed it. Same with also the property management and asset management side of everything. And, uh, another thing is the underwriting itself for me, like how he, for you was like, Oh, actually what's running the deal was the thing that got you excited about real estate. It's for me, it's finding a, the good one. That's like, you know, I've been underwriting so many deals yeah. that when I finally find one, that's like, oh, this is good. You know, I get a nice little kick from it. It's like, oh, I should go show this to Evan or to Drew. Like, yeah. this is exciting. So I've been really surprised with basically how much I've enjoyed all of it. You know, I thought I would like some things. I wouldn't like some other things. But how much I've enjoyed all of it together has been something that sort of surprised me. Yeah, that's interesting. The, yeah, with the different like lender checklist or cleaning mm-hmm. things closed like that there is like a certain like satisfaction, like getting stuff like checked yeah. off the list or mm-hmm. um, yeah, like in or how you can do things better or The feeling faster. of completion. It's just like the tick in the boxes sort of. Yeah. Is. So no, I agree with that. Is there anything that I'm, I've done where it's like surprising or like that's interesting that I could do it or like a skill that maybe surprised you that um, maybe you'll end up developing or learning mm-hmm. about? Or, well, you already spoke about it. It was just that asking questions continuously, you know? You know, you've done, you've bought like, you know, $200 million of property and you're still asking questions every single call. You know, I'm on so many of these calls with you. And I think that's, you know, that helps us as well. Cause sometimes the questions you ask are things that I'm thinking, or yeah. I know I've spoken with Sam about this. Like, oh yeah, I was wondering that too. And, uh, and, and Drew asked about it. So it's little things like that, where you feel more comfortable asking questions. If you see, you know, your boss asking questions as well. Yeah. So little things like that, you know, it's like, it's, it's good to see that it's not cause you know, some industries where it's like the, and, and you've spoken about this yeah. before where the previous experience you've had, where it's like sit down and only the top guys talk, but it's here. It's how open it is. It's something that it was a really good surprise in terms of like actually being able to learn so much. I've learned more in one year than basically my entire school career. Yeah. So. And I think, yeah, that's interesting. And I, I feel the same way with like, yeah, with work where I've mm-hmm. learned so much, um, of actually doing it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the question asking things huge. And then two, there's things that, um, yeah. And as I mean, I'm asking everybody questions. I'm asking you guys questions too. You know, mm-hmm. like there's things you guys know how to do better than I do or know about, or might've heard about that I haven't. Mm-hmm. So, 
Yeah, I think that's a it's a good environment to have when everybody's sort of curious. It helps yeah. everybody be on the same page and everybody feels comfortable, you know, speaking up and talking uh, at meetings and everything. Which yeah. Is okay, nice. Well, yeah, let's let's leave it there. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Javi. Appreciate you uh, getting on. Happy to be on again. <laughs> yeah, nice. Well, yeah, good. Yeah, good question. Some things I really hadn't hadn't thought too much about because it's like it's hard to. I feel like the traits that you have, it might it'd be hard to develop those. So like if someone was not detailed or something like that, you may not be able to develop that mm-hmm. other than just go slower maybe and try to try. But that was at least, you know, some of these things you, you can't maybe develop, but then you mm-hmm. could always get a partner that's like that. Like if you're, you know, the worst with details, like you could get a partner who's the best and then yeah. you're the gas pedal, they're the brake kind of, you know, mm-hmm. like it's like if it would make, you know, there's ways you can, do you know kind of lean into what you're good at as well Mm -hmm. i mean this is just kind of how it worked out for me but if i was you know not detailed or um had a harder time with like a strategy like then just go get a partner like that but then i would be stronger on you know some other aspect that they needed so right like that would work because yeah i think then that's maybe just the last thing then if you're gonna get a partner try to not have where it's just like a version like the same ver- same thing you're doing like you mm-hmm. really bring in different skill sets or can be working on different stuff and really like one plus one will equal more than two in that yeah. if you're just doing the same thing it's like what's the i've seen that where some partners it's like they're just on every phone call together it's like there's mm-hmm. i don't know if like more is actually happening like it's mm-hmm. just two people doing something together for like uh having yeah. like some company almost like <laughs> you know like so that would be you know uh that's a thought too like if you have a partner to want different skills yeah. For sure. Because that's what I've sort of been hiring for. Like, you guys are all better at Excel than I am. And certain, you know, other things that um, you guys would be better for. Like, mm-hmm. I, I probably don't need more, like, uh, and more, like, near-term, like, strategy help. Like, that I kind of have. Mm-hmm. So, but, like, a lot of other stuff, I, you know, yeah, we could we could use more of. Diversity of skill and thought is always good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. We'll leave it there. Thanks again. No, thank you. All right. Great. Well, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for joining us on the Rise and Invest podcast. Please be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you enjoy your podcasts. If you'd like to dive even deeper into real estate investing, check out our company's website, riseinvest.com, where we have numerous free resources and information that can help both active and passive real estate investors. Our 100 plus page passive investing guidebook, our trends report, and our blog are all available on our website. If you are an accredited investor, you can get started today as a passive investor in our multifamily investment opportunities by hitting the invest now button on our website, The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Drew Brenneman and guests as of the date of recording and do not purport to reflect the views or opinions of Rise Invest Holdings LLC and its subsidiaries. The views and opinions are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon or deemed as investment or tax advice or an offer to buy or sell securities and the speaker cannot be held responsible for any direct or incidental loss incurred by applying any of the information offered.